<laughs> Hello, YouTube. Yeah, exactly. This is Ryan. He can't even remember his YouTube handle. But, um, so he accosted me on the street. He was driving by. Creepy. It was creepy. And, Tom, Tom, you don't know me, but... <laughs> uh, it is so funny. I mean, you my custom bill? Mm-hmm. Yeah, very nice. Had to bring it down. Oh, uh, yes, case. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so we're down on the boat having a smoke. He brought down some uh, Brigham English. You can see my video style is very informal. And so, you know, there's a little bit of stuff happening here. Um, just having a smoke. I know. I, I just, uh, we would never, unless I had a Honda that broke down, <laughs> <laughs> which I don't, <laughs> um, we would just never have run into each other. You know? So, I, you know, I just, I've been watching the, like I said, watching your journey up here and couldn't, you know, had to at least come and give it a shot. <laughs> happy to be aboard and, you know, I'm enjoying a fight with one of my, my favorite YouTube guys. So, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Like I say, I just never expect anybody to even watch these things, you know. And it's, it's me. I like to smoke socially like this. To me, that is, uh, hits a sweet spot for me. And so making these videos is kind of like that. Yeah. And so it allows me to smoke where otherwise I just would, I just would not have a smoke. So it's a weird thing, but it works for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just amazed. I suppose that's the same, you know. I get to enjoy a fight with you when I, you know, when I watch. Mm. Uh, watch so. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing that. One of my faves. <laughs> one of the greatest. You guys know one of the greatest. <laughs> I just can't believe it. I can't believe it. I know. So we're just sitting here out in the harbor. Just having a smoke. It looks all gray and gloomy, but it isn't really. I mean, it's not overcast. It's just that smoke from the... Where are the main fires? The Chilkaton or somewhere up there? All over. Caribou? Yeah. And all over. Yeah. Well. <laughs> lucky. Lucky? Well, we're, you know, lucky <laughs> here that it's, you know, it's just one of those things that could just happen so fast. Oh, well, okay. Like, I mean, oh, yeah. you, know, you know. I do. You do know. But, uh, so... Yeah, those poor guys up there. I mean, think how if it's hot here, it's just it's uh it's 42 there mm -hmm. probably, you know. So they're showing in the paper there the last week a little grass fire on the side of the road and a bunch of people pulled out and uh, they put it out with uh -huh. I don't know what maybe yeah. extinguishers in their car or something. Balls of water. Yeah, feet, right, and right. blankets slapping it out. Yeah. And you can do a lot of things. Well, good for them. Mm -hmm indication a level of fear <laughs> which is respect for fire yeah uh-huh well like i wish i knew the date but you know vancouver island right? oh the whole island at one point yeah, yeah well so what have we been, like the 20s Something could be like yeah right i know uh my uncle talks about it often but i can't remember the date there's all signs all over the place if you were to ah. go around and hmm. up to Falls park and uh God, think of the volume of wood that burned I mean, uh, <laughs> it defies uh, comprehension, really. Wow. Up and down the North Pacific coast by canoe and mission ship. You know, one of the great things about these times on the boat is that I have time to read. And I make time to read. You always have time to do whatever you want to do. You just don't prioritize it high enough. So, on these trips, reading becomes this wonderful pleasure. <laughs> and this is um, from Greg and Carol's library next door here. I'm rafted out to them. Up and down the North Pacific coast by canoe and mission ship by the Reverend Thomas Crosby, the Missionary Society of the Methodist Church, uh, Toronto, Canada, Copyright Canada, 1914. So this is uh, talking about a Bella Bella stop, uh, a 
at 11 o'clock a.m. We all sat down on mats close around the fire in the old chief's house. After all were seated, a dish with water in it was passed around so that each one might wash his fingers. They were particular, very particular about this in those days. A dirty rag was passed around to dry our fingers. While these preparations were being made, loud conversation was carried on by different leading men, one of whom would tell of the war between the Haidas and the Bella Bellas long ago when slaves and scalps were taken, others of wonderful hunting expeditions, struggles with bears, and the like. Then, long wooden dishes were placed within reach of each one, and the courses, seven in number, commenced. We had potatoes, dried salmon and grease, grease meaning ulik in grease, um, candlefish, uh, grease, they're so greasy that um, they're kind of cooked and then le left to rot a little bit, and then the grease is skimmed off. Uh, dried salmon and grease, sweet spruce bark, salmon, and finally wound up with some very plain flapjacks made of flour and water. A number of speeches were made which had to do with their families and their intercourse of more recent date with white people. They acknowledged the kindness of their host and spoke of his family history and the greatness of his relatives. We had been there from 11 o'clock until 4 in the afternoon when they got through. Kali was the wife of Chief Nisut at Tongass, Alaska. He died very suddenly. In those days, they said that those who died from sickness or accident were bewitched. They consulted the old witch doctor, and he seemed likely to fasten the responsibility for the death of the chief on Kali, his wife. She overheard and, in fear of being taken as a witch and tortured to death, got a little canoe and stole away in the night. She traveled all the way to Fort Simpson, and there she remained, never daring to go back. She became a devoted Christian and was often a very youth was often very useful to us as interpreter to the Alaskan people. When they found that she had gone, they blamed an old helpless grandmother who, they said, was the witch who had caused the death of the chief. They took her to the beach, drove a stake into the ground, and tied her to it in a crouching position. No one at the risk of his life dared to release her. As the tide rose, she perished. These Bella Bella Indians were said to be warlike and in later years were the dread of some of the coast tribes as well as of the white settlers. It is said that at Whidbey Island, a Colonel Eby was murdered in cold blood by them. And that is record. This happened years ago when some white man had willfully shot down one of their number, one of the Bella Bellas. We can scarcely wonder at their action, for Indian law is life for life. They think that all white men are relatives, and if they cannot get the murderer, the natural way is to kill another white man. <laughs> it was now time to retire. We lay down amid the din of howling dogs, the conjurer's rattle and drum, and what seemed to be a score more beating time with short sticks on boards to his weird song. We were soon asleep. This was a missionary um, going about their business up the Skeena River. Robert and I soon retired to the woods to sleep, thinking we would have a better chance to rest there than in the smoky houses, where there were hundreds of dried salmon hanging over the smoldering fire and the quarreling dogs upon the floor. <laughs> It's, this is filled with all these little anecdotes that um, kind of bring it to life. Always keep your mouth, mouth moist. Seems to be the ongoing advice as far as managing your pipe smoking risk. seems to reduce damage to your mucous membranes. Shamanism and its evils. The various grades of medicine men or conjurers were organized into secret societies, initiation into which was considered an honor and was solemnized by certain potlatching ceremonies. 
principal degrees of honor were fire eaters, dog eaters, and man eaters. The man eaters were a secret society of medicine men professing to eat human flesh. Sometimes they would exhume a body, tear it limb from limb, and stand before the public gaze professing to devour the flesh. The man-eaters, when initiating a doctor, went through a most cruel ceremony. To get power, the candidate for honors would go to the woods and be there for weeks clothed in a bare skin, professedly fasting and having communion with the spirits. He would then come down through the village and, seizing hold of strong men's arms, tear the flesh off to the bone. It is needless to say that these man-eaters were a terror to all people. On my second visit to Kitimat years ago, several of the young men had been converted and wished to have a teacher come and help them. After many days of evangelistic work among them, my party were getting ready to leave when one, Joe, came down to our canoe and said he wanted to go to Simpson with us, Port Simpson. I said, no, Joe, you must stay and help the other boys to be Christians and carry on meetings. Joe said, I'd like to stay, sir, but the man-eater is coming from the mountains and he'll bite me. I said, surely not, Joe. Surely no man will bite you. He rolled up his old shirt sleeve and said, look here, sir. Here is where I have been bitten many times, and to our surprise we saw that his arm was all deformed by old scars. I said, you may go with us, Joe. <laughs> the dog eaters, when making a doctor, had a revolting ceremony. After the candidates had fasted for some time, they would crawl forth, passing through the village, each with a live dog in his hands, tearing some tearing them limb from limb and others eating the quivering flesh. The one who could eat the most live dog was said to be the bravest doctor. The fire eaters, after preparation by fasting in the woods or mountains, would rush into the houses and upon the roofs, throwing the boards and bark about. They would spread the fire all over the floor, walk in it, and profess to eat it. Here's a bear story. The physical condition of the people along the northwestern coast constituted an urgent call for medical assistance. Besides diseases due to dissipation and other causes, dissipation, what would that be, like venereal diseases? I don't know. How about smallpox? Probably, well, uh, cases of injury by wild animals were constantly occurring on hunting expeditions as the following story vouched for by Bishop Ridley well illustrates. Up in the mountains bordering on the Nass River, a great chief was out hunting, his little son his only companion. They, they had camped near the river and were walking one evening not far from the camp. The chief was unarmed as he was just about to settle down for the night's rest. As he was passing around a rock by a very narrow trail, he suddenly met a large grizzly face to face. Unarmed as he was, it was not possible to do anything but fight as the monster attacked him at once. Quakshin was an Indian of great strength, wiry, brave, and hardened by experience and adventure. He was ready of wit and quick in decision as well as action. At once he grappled with the brute which now stood on its hind legs. He put his arms around the bear, hugged it close, and with his teeth began to eat his way through the hair and skin of the monstrous throat. As his face was close under the bear's lower jaw, the beast could not bite him. He was between the two forelegs, hugging and being hugged, breast to breast, and for this very reason the animal's forepaws were unable to inflict any wounds. The hindpaws were the only destructive weapons the bear could use, and the teeth of the chief were his only effective resource. They rolled and tumbled, under and over, up and down, in desperate combat. The bear tore and lacerated the man's legs and thighs in an awful manner, but it could not get its hindpaws up to his vital parts. All the while the intelligence, will, spirit, and teeth of the chief were telling. Though sore and bleeding, he chewed away until he made an opening through the skin and tore the jugular vein almost out of the savage throat. Both were bleeding, but the grizzly's wounds were now more deadly, and only a little time was required to see the end of the struggle. The moment seemed eternities, but at last, with a growling groan, the bear sank dead at his feet, and the chief was saved. With the aid of the little boy, he managed to bandage his limbs, which were torn till sinews and bone were almost scraped clean the parts hanging in threads. Finally, the chief and his son arrived at home. He got well and lived many years afterwards to tell the horrible tale. <laughs> wow. What do you mean for men?